Welcome to our Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, The Power is Yours, Nutrition and Exercise to Reduce Breast Cancer Risk. I'm Vicki Newell, and I manage the Primetime Alive program here at Mary Greeley. As a reminder, if you want more information about Primetime Alive or to sign up for another program, you can go to our website, mgmc.org slash PTA. Our presenters today are Kelly Flater and Brenda Vagert. <laughs> know how to say it. that's okay somebody in the crowd was happy happy to know how to pronounce Brenda's last name and so um, anyways it's Faggart it's an interesting spelling for most of us and I had to ask myself so there we go our presenters today Kelly Flater and Brenda Vagert. Kelly is a graduate from Iowa State University, has been working as a registered dietitian for about eight years, and six of those years have been here at Mary Greeley. Kelly has held a variety of roles during her time at Mary Greeley, including coverage of inpatient units of medical, surgical, behavioral health, acute rehab, and oncology and eventually transitioned to providing outpatient oncology nutrition care about four years ago. Brenda has been in the fitness industry for 10 years. She's a certified ACE personal trainer and certified corrective exercise specialist. She has completed the TRX training course and is also certified in foam rolling. Brenda has been working at at Mary Greeley for 10 years and enjoys working with clients, small groups, and large group fitness classes. And Kelly's going to start uh, today, so please welcome Kelly. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been looking forward to doing this talk with you guys. Um, like Vicki mentioned, I kind of moved more into a oncology nutrition role over the past few years. So um, this is something that I, I talk about a lot with patients and um, enjoy the topic. So hopefully we can get you some good information today. Um, to kind of introduce the topic, you know, nutrition and exercise, it, it very much is a lifestyle kind of component. Um, and when we're talking about cancer, breast cancer, um, you know, there's a, a misconception out there that a lot of cancers are genetic. Um, but actually, when you look at the cases and the research behind that, genetics play a role in maybe 5 to 10% of all cancer diagnoses. So um, the rest of it, that 90 to 95%, we can attribute to some of those lifestyle factors. So nutrition and exercise are just a couple of those lifestyle factors. Um, there's lots of them. I have some of them listed here, you know, smoking, wearing sunscreen, our exposures to chemicals, things like that. Um, and if we kind of look at just the uh, preventable things, things that are in our control, um, they kind of estimate somewhere between 70 to 90% of those cancers may be preventable by some of those controllable factors. So um, that statistic, it's um, I got that from the World Cancer Research Fund. So depending on you know what organization you follow, if you follow any of those, um, you might see varying percentages there. Um, it's a hard one to, to estimate. That's why it's kind of a big range. But um, just know there's there's some things that are in our control that we can do to uh, reduce our risks. So today, um, our focus is on eating right and exercising and maintaining that healthy body composition. All right. So um, kind of the main organizations that I look to for recommendations, who's kind of like the, the gold standard, I guess, on um, looking at these lifestyle research um, and putting together recommendations for people to follow. Um, I like the American Institute of Cancer Research and then the World Cancer Research Fund International. It's a, a mouthful. Um, but they mm -hmm. kind of look at all of the research worldwide um, and they put together their recommendations and they actually publish a report that they update every five years or so. Um, so they're a very good, those two resources together, um, very credible, very up-to-date, um, and very thorough. So we like that. Um, and they assess and grade the quality of the nutrition and lifestyle research by cancer type. So you can actually go on their website and see specific re recommendations for breast cancer or for colon cancer specifically. Um, so kind of nice that they separate it out like that. Okay, and then when we're looking at some of these recommendations, um, 
it's kind of good to know how they're grading things. So some things will have strong evidence, meaning that the body of research that is out there, um, there's enough of it. It's been replicated multiple times, um, and it's very convincing. Like it's, we're pretty solid, solidly stand on this this recommendation. There's really good evidence for it. Um, there's also limited evidence. So. What that means is that there's still some pretty good research out there, not as much as something that would have some strong evidence behind it, um, but everything's pointing kind of in this in this direction. So we feel pretty good about it, but we'd still like some more some more studies to see, you know, more re- reproducible results, I guess. Um, and when we look at the breast cancer recommendations, they do kind of categorize it between your premenopausal breast cancer and then your postmenopausal breast cancer. So we might have a couple different recommendations depending on uh, the age of onset. Um, and then their recommendations, so I have a nice list over there. <laughs> They've actually identified lots of things um, that maybe contribute to our risk for breast cancer. So some of these things are not um, anything that we have a lot of control over, such as um, like how tall you are or what your birth weight was, things like that. Um, But there's a lot of nutrition things on here. And we'll kind of go through those today um, and highlight those specifically. All right. So first up, we have our non-starchy vegetables. Everybody's favorite food group, right? (laughs) Um, So the recommendation here, uh, consumption of non-starchy vegetables decreases the risk of ER negative breast cancers. Um, So ER negative, that means estrogen receptor negative. Um, So this would be a non-hormonal type breast cancer. Um, The grade of this is limited. So there's some good research out there and it's all kind of consistently pointing in in this direction. Um, So hopefully we'll get some more research in the future that relates to this. But um, I still tell folks that, you know, consuming non-starchy vegetables is a a good thing. So um, the research that's out there right now, it is showing three servings a day, and you'll get about a 12% reduction in your breast cancer risk. So so what counts as a non-starchy vegetable? It's actually a very large um, food group if you look at it that way. Um, We've got some nice pictures up here, a lot of your leafy greens, um, more of your fibrous, I guess, vegetables, so asparagus, green beans, um, tomatoes, things like that. Okay, next up, our foods with carotenoids. Um, So consumption of foods containing carotenoids decreases the risk of breast cancer. This one they left unspecified, so it's not um, specific to either a hormonal type breast cancer or a non-hormonal type breast cancer. I'd say kind of just any breast cancer in general, um, eating carotenoids will help reduce your risk. Um, Also a limited amount of research here, um, still kind of pointing in that direction that this is a good thing to have into your diet. Um, Not as specific with their dose, but they do see that the more carotenoids that you eat throughout the day, the lower your risk is. So that might be something with more research in the future, we might be able to get a more specific uh, recommendation for how many servings of a carotenoid food should we have per day. Now, what are carotenoids? It's really hard to look at a food and be like, oh, yeah, that's my, that's my source of carotenoids for today. Um, <laughs> so carotenoids, they're a, a class of phytonutrients. So um, that's also another kind of big word. Uh, phyto meaning plant, nutrient meaning something that um, is good for our body. It has a role in our body. Um, so we only get these from plant-based foods. So you got to think of fruits and vegetables and grains will be you know, a source of those phytonutrients. Um, And within the carotenoid, it's um, kind of like an umbrella term. There's lots of different kinds. So I have a few of them here listed. Uh, Maybe some of the most common ones that you may have heard of, lycopene, that's one that um, kind of gets brought up a lot. It's researched a lot. Um, And maybe beta carotene, that's a really common one that we hear about as well. So how do you know if you're eating carotenoids? Um, A good rule of thumb, usually that orange-yellow color that we see in in fruits and vegetables, that pigment comes from carotenoids. Um, So the pumpkins, carrots, um, bananas, corn, things like that, um, if you're eating something in that kind of color range, um, you can know that you're having a carotenoid that day. 
Um, there's some other foods that also have carotenoids, like you see spinach up here, avocados. Um, they don't really fall into that rule of thumb, but um, that's something you can look up if you go to like a Healthline or something like that. You might be able to find a little list of foods that contain uh, carotenoids. Um, but in general, if you're just grocery shopping and you're looking for yellow, orange kind of colored food, um, those are going to be your carotenoid foods for sure. All right, next up we have dairy. So consumption of dairy products decreases breast cancer risk. Again, that's unspecified, so I would just say any breast cancer. Um, again, this is a, a, limited, um, a limited, limited amount of evidence, um, and it mostly pertains to premenopausal women. So we didn't see, the research isn't showing a lot of, of risk reduction in the postmenopause age group. Um, they do look at any form of dairy, so milk, cheese, yogurt, um, kind of the whole group. Um, and again, we don't have a, a recommendation for a specific number of servings per day. Okay. This kind of relates to, to dairy, um, but they did separate it out into its own kind of recommendation, um, high calcium diet. So we know dairy foods are, are a really great source of calcium, um, but a lot of other foods have calcium too. So um, we might be getting calcium from other sources, um, but a diet that is high in calcium uh, decreases the risk of breast cancer. That is also a limited amount of evidence there. Um, but this one, when we look at it by calcium, um, it does apply to both pre- and postmenopausal women. So a 13% decrease in risk per 300 milligrams of dietary calcium per day uh, for premenopause. Um, and then a little bit less of an intense risk reduction for the postmenopause. Um, age group, that's a 4% risk in that 300 milligrams of calcium per day. Um, and to kind of give you an idea of what 300 milligrams is, that's about, a, you know, an eight ounce glass of milk is about 300 milligrams. So for a whole day, how much calcium do you need? Um, Premenopause women, uh, we recommend at least 1,000 milligrams. Um, and then postmenopausal women, 1,200 milligrams. And then I have all of our wonderful food sources of calcium. So like I said, dairy, it is a really good source of calcium, uh, but so are our leafy greens. So um, spinach, uh, kale, turnip greens, things like that, our non-starchy vegetable group <laughs> will have some. Uh, some seafood, if it has bones in it, like your sardines, um, some of those canned fish will have like the bones in there. Um, any grains that are fortified, uh, fortified orange juice, um, tofu, soy products, those kinds of things, um, those will all have calcium in there. So a lot more uh, variety of uh, foods if you look at this by the calcium nutrient instead of doing just dairy. Okay, then um, alcohol is our next category. So consumption of alcoholic drinks uh, increases risk of breast cancer, unspecified, so any type of breast cancer. Um, and this is the first one that we're at where we have a really strong recommendation um, for both uh, the premenopausal age range and the postmenopausal age range. Um, and this is also um, what we call like a dose, a dose response. So we do have... Um, like a percentage and increase in risk per, per how much alcohol is drank. So 5% increase in risk per 10 grams of ethanol. So um, 10 grams of ethanol is pretty close to like a one, one standard drink. Um, and then a 9% increase in risk per 10 grams of ethanol per day for postmenopausal women. All right. Oh, and I just mentioned that. So how much alcohol is in a standard drink? Um, and it's actually about 14 grams in actuality. I don't know why they research it by 10 grams at a time, but um, that's what they did. Uh, so we have our standard drinks here. So one regular beer, um, nine to 10 ounces of like a hard seltzer or malt beverage, five ounces of wine, um, or one and a half fluid ounces of a, a liquor like vodka or rum, something like that. And how much is okay to drink? This is where it gets kind of, um, gets a little tricky. So they do have standard recommendations for alcohol. Um, one per day for women, two per day for men, uh, but not every day. So um, yeah, how that looks, it might be different for, for different people. Um, some folks are the, the kind that will just have a, a drink at 
you know, holidays or a special occasion versus there's other folks that are maybe once or twice a week they're having a drink. So um, basically kind of the more you drink, the more your risk is affected. So I would consider your own risk factors and, and kind of... Um, kind of those social environments that you're in and uh, uh, keep that in mind. But um, it is a, a known carcinogen alcohol and that's why that, that recommendation is pretty strong. Okay. Uh, so overall weight gain during adulthood, um, that is also a risk factor that was identified. Uh, diet patterns that contain um, frequent intake of, you know, calorie dense and nutrient poor foods um, tend to lead to weight gain and increase adiposity. So that's um, adiposity is how much fat mass you have on your body. Um, so yeah, that diet pattern matters. So you know these kinds of foods, they're they're wonderful. We should all have them from time to time. Um, but it's going to be the frequency, and if you're balancing it out with some of those other foods that we talked about, so the non-starchy vegetables, your foods with carotenoids. Are you still getting some dairy in there or calcium sources? Um, I think the lack of those foods is probably a big contributor as well. Um, so if you don't have those and you're having a lot of foods that don't have those good nutrients in them, um, that's kind of where the, the issue is. Okay, so how do we put this all together into, you know, something that we can do every day? Um, you know, eat your veggies. I'd say, you know, try and have those with, with every meal if you can. Um, go for a variety of colors. So um, like I said, with the, the carotenoids, um, that yellow orange pigment, um, different colors have different nutrients. So um, if you're doing a colorful plate and you have different colors of fruits and vegetables, you're going to know you're getting a lot of different nutrients. Um, and that's kind of a good, just a good, good rule of thumb to go with. Um, get your, your dairy. If you're not a dairy eater or drinker, uh, make sure you're getting calcium from somewhere else. Uh, reduce your alcohol intake. Um, and then also reduce your high-calorie, nutrient-poor foods, um, such as candies, sodas, um, things like that that are heavily processed. So popular diet patterns that work, um, that we know that work really well. So Mediterranean diet, um, time and time again, it's, it comes through as one of the best diet patterns to follow. Um, and it is, it's, it's full of fruits and vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, lean meats. Um, so it's a really good one to refer to. Uh, Plant-based diet, um, again, more of a fruit, vegetable, whole grain kind of focus with that. Uh, same with your DASH diet and your vegetarian diet. So any of those would be be wonderful ones if you're kind of looking around, looking for something with some guidelines. Um, any one of those would be really good ones to look to. Um, I also talk about this plate method here. So we have a, a diagram of that um, where, you know, it kind of takes away a lot of the, the rules and just has you look at your, your plate when you're putting together a meal, half of it being fruits and vegetables, a quarter being a grain or maybe a starchy vegetable like potato or something like that. Um, and then a smaller portion of protein, like your chicken, uh, beef, um, seafood, something like that. So then you're getting a, a larger proportion of those plant-based foods. All right. And then I do have some, some resources here. So um, the first two were those... Uh, kind of organizations I mentioned earlier that give us a lot of those recommendations. So American Institute of Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund, um, really great websites to go to. Uh, the bottom ones, the Cancer Dietitian and then Cook for Your Life, really great um, like blogs, articles, recipes, um, newsletters, things like that. So if you're looking for something a little, maybe a little bit more fun than um, a research website, I would go to either one of those for some, some good information and some recipes. All right. Brenda's up next. <laughs> Good job, Kelly. Hello. Nice to see some familiar faces that I, I know some people. Hi, thanks for coming. My name's Brenda Vaggert. I just got married last year, and my last name was Smith. <laughs> There's my joke, ladies. <laughs> All right. Um, so Lucille and Ethel, right? They're riding bikes. They look like they're having a good time because exercise is fun. Can I get you guys to stand up for me? Let's do a little movement. All right. So I can't come out there, but we're just going to we're going to do this. 
So I teach a lot of um, exercise classes to older adults. A couple of them are here. Hi. <laughs> um, so we're just going to do a non-weighted because we don't have any weights. And if you don't have any weights and you want to exercise at home, you could use a water bottle, a uh, can of soup. So some bicep curls. Your bicep muscle is this in your, in your arm right here. You got two biceps, two. So do little bicep curls with me. There you go. All right. Good job. And then we're going to do some lateral shoulder raises. So just raise those arms out to the side. If you have shoulder impingements, you know, we, obviously if you can do one arm, we don't want anything to hurt, right? All right, good job. And then we always like to throw in a little balance. So I'm going to have you guys just to kind of lift up to your tippy toes called calf raises. Good job. Very good. I'll do a couple more. And then one more, so you got your chair right behind you. So we're gonna do what we call squats or sit to stand. So I'm just gonna have you just bend your knees a little, kind of like you're gonna sit down, but you're not quite sitting down, right? Half squats, there you go. How about four more? Three, two, and one. Very good, good job, all right. You can have a seat, thanks for joining in with me in the fun, right? Because fitness is fun. The CDC recommends that you get 150 minutes of exercise per week, moderate exercise. That's 30 minutes a day, five days a week. If you feel like you can't get 30 minutes all in one time, you could break that up into 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, or even break it, up, break it down even more, 10 minutes in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Some lower intensity exercise could be walking, water aerobics, dancing, house or, uh, house or lawn work. If you want to get a little more vigorous, you could do 75 minutes of, of vigorous exercise per week, which could include uh, jogging or running, riding a bike up a hill, or playing basketball. Who wants to go play basketball? <laughs> <laughs> some examples of some exercises, right? Limiting our time on TV and our electronics. Using the stairs rather than the elevator. Or parking further away at the grocery store or the mall, wherever you like to shop. And if you can walk or bike to your destination. Exercise at lunch with your coworkers or friends. Hey, this is for the Mary Greeley employees. Walk to go see your coworker instead of emailing them, right? Have a good time with that. And when you're planning your vacations, do an um, active vacation rather than just a driving trip. Another example, go dancing with your uh, friends or spouse. Wear a pedometer or a, a fitness watch, very popular these days, increasing your steps. For um, age of younger than 60, it is recommended eight to 10,000 steps per day. Over 60, six, excuse me, six to 8,000 steps per day, over 60. Um, joining a sports team, pickleball is real popular right now, right? Anybody play pickleball? Nope, me neither. I don't want to hurt, my, hurt myself, <laughs> so I'll stay away from that. Cardio and strength training are not only good to boost your mood and to get better, to, better sleep, but to help keep off weight. Obesity is a major contributor to the nation's cancer toll and is quickly overtaking tobacco as a leading preventable cause of cancer. This is according to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Making a healthy diet and regu regular exercise that much more important. Exercise has many benefits. But high on the priority is, is a healthy weight. Yes, I'm repeating that. We're going to talk about obesity today. Regular exercise helps reduce the risk of obesity. Associated disease in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, many types of cancer, including breast cancer. Women who get regular exercise, well, and women and men, right? We're not going to rule out the men have a 10 to 20% lower risk of breast cancer risk than women who aren't active. And this benefit is seen clearly in, mostly in um, postmenopausal women. Being active may also lower blood estrogen levels. Women with lower blood estrogen levels have a lower risk of breast cancer 
than women with higher levels. And exercise may boost the body's immune system so it can help kill or slow the growth of cancer cells. So I found a couple studies, and we're going to talk about these. Hopefully we won't get too boring with this. <laughs> I appreciate your attention. <laughs> uh, Dr. Stephen Hurstein, his research area is to understand the drivers of obesity-related breast cancer and develop effective prevention intervention. His progress thus far, Dr. Hurstein and his colleagues developed an easily adopted intermittent energy restrict restricted diet regimen. When compared to weight loss surgery, an intermittent diet was more effective for reversing the adverse effects of obesity on breast cancer. It may thus provide a more affordable and feasible alternative strategy to reduce, reduce breast cancer rather than bariatric surgery or severe diet restriction. Importantly, both weight loss methods reprogram the microbiome, that's the bacteria that inhibits the intestines, to be healthier and produce fewer inflammatory metabolites. Dr. Hurstein and his colleagues tested whether the pro-cancer effects of diet-induced obesity and or the anti cancer effects of intermittent dieting are transmitted via gut microbiota. They found that some of the pro-cancer effects of diet-induced obesity are transmitted through the microbiome, but the anti-cancer effects of intermittent dieting are not. And they're still doing further um, studies on this, but that's kind of the gist of what I got from that one. And then Dr. Ann McTiernan, I'll let you look at that a second. Her research is characterizing the effect of exercise and weight loss on markers of breast cancer risk in women of all body sizes and fitness levels. The impact is that her physical activity is associated with improved survival of breast cancer at any age, which may be due to part in the effect of weight. Right? Back to that weight. Dr. McTiernan and others have shown that weight loss has significant long-term effects on biological factors linked to breast cancer risk. However, exercise may reduce risk in other ways beyond weight loss. Dr. McTiernan's work suggests that some of its biological effects are the greatest in the hours after a workout. She is currently studying the acute effects of exercise on biomarkers on breast cancer risk in participants of varying body types and fitness levels, the results of which may be informative in assessing and developing prevention interventions. She and her team launched, launched the Acute Effects of Exercise in Women called the ACE Trial, the first ever clinical trial to test the immediate effects of exercise on markers related to breast cancer in healthy women. If the markers are significantly altered, it could help support guidelines for daily exercise and breast cancer prevention. So that sounds like a good deal, right? If they get that figured out. And it may indicate that exercise even without weight loss is beneficial. Her progress thus far. Dr. McTiernan and her team collected blood samples muscle, and muscle biopsies in a small subset of participants before and after exercise from 102 healthy participants. They found intriguing ev evidence that exercise changes muscle cell proteins involved in the regulation of genes that are important in breast cancer. They also measured markers related to inflammation and angiogenesis both of which contribute to cancer progression. To assess the effects of exercise on these markers in normal weight and overweight obese women. Oh, not yet. <laughs> so the main takeaway that I think that I learned from my research on this is that breast cancer and obesity are both on the rise worldwide and the two diseases are connected. Obesity can significantly increase a women's risk of breast cancer after menopause. 
And women who are obese at the time of diagnosis have a 30% higher chance of dying from breast cancer or other causes in the years following her di their diagnosis. The good news, though, is that studies are consistently shown that making lifestyle changes, including keeping a healthy diet like Kelly talked about, losing weight, and doing moderate intensity exercise, like I said, 150 minutes um, per week, can play a role in preventing breast cancer and improving prognosis after breast cancer diagnosis. So my last slide here is I do teach a courage in motion class and I do see a participant. Hi. Has um I'm sorry if I called you out. <laughs> and um it's been a real beneficial class for me. Um I don't have cancer or have had cancer. Um so it's been these ladies are, are very, very lovely uh to work with. And um, they wrote a couple testimonials, so I'd like to read those to you now. Courage in Motion is a great program for cancer patients to return the, to their quote-unquote normal lifestyles. Cancer treatments leave their mark both physically and emotionally. Courage in Motion program allows patients to exercise to regain strength and muscle tone lost, plus balance, endurance, and stretching using several types of exercise and equipment. This is from the, from the testimonial. Personally, I have found it very useful to, in helping to maintain my balance and strength. The smaller class size allows us emotionally to talk and find how similar we are in our journeys. And then another testimonial is, um, I have been receiving cancer treatment for the past 13 years. As a result of this treatment, I have developed decreased strength and balance issues. I like courage and motion for the social support, the work on flexibility and muscle strength. And the third one I have, and the final one, I like courage and motion because it, because it is a nice mix of different moves. It is not the type of workout where you leave sweating. I tell everyone just keep moving, simple stretches and walking. Our instructor makes it fun. It's been a nice support group in my cancer journey. So, um, and then there's my online resources where I found my information. And we'll open it up for questions. Questions are open for either presenter, Kelly or Brenda. If you just raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone. Tell us again what the, uh, the moderate exercises are and what you consider the vigorous exercises. Sure. Um, moderate exercises, walking, water aerobics. I also teach water aerobics. Um, it's a very good, nice, warm water, fun class to take. Um, light housework and yard work. Um, your more vigorous would be running or jogging biking up a hill, or um, taking a, like, I don't know if you're into, into group fitness classes, but the, there's some, like, silver sneakers would be on your more moderate side, and then uh, what they call HIT, high-intensity interval training, would be more your vigorous exercise. Mm This is kind of totally a different quest question. I had ovarian cancer 22 years ago. I was told that I had a greater risk of getting breast cancer and uh, colon cancer. Have there been any studies done on what the risk is, you know, plus doing everything else that you've said here? I was much heavier than what I am now. And I was just curious if there's a percentage now because you've had a cancer and getting a breast cancer and colon cancer? I, I don't know that exact answer, um, but 
kind of my my recommendations, what I go with and what uh, the, the sources I, I follow, um, they recommend following the same kind of lifestyle uh, factors and, and interventions for prevention during treatment and survivorship. Um, so like our recommendations for that and prevention, even for somebody that's had cancer, would, would be the same. Um, but yeah, I don't know about what your your risk is of, of developing another cancer if you've already had cancer. I, I don't yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any questions online, Tim? Yes, we do. Is there something in spinach that inhibits <laughs> calcium absorption? If yes, yes, does it help to eat other calcium-rich foods along with the spinach, like spinach lasagna? Oh. That's a good question. Um, you know, there there may be. I th there's lots of, um, some people will call them like an anti-nutrient where, um, you know, it might reduce absorption of another nutrient. Um, but yeah, I, I would say eating the combination foods is always a better idea than just having like a pile of one food, if that makes sense. Um, our nutrients like to work in a synergistic fashion, so they like to work together. Um, so absolutely, I would say put lasagna in everything or put, not, don't put lasagna in everything, <laughs> put spinach in everything. <laughs> put spinach in everything. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any more questions? Okay. I'll ask a question while I'm walking over to Sharon here. I've heard, you know, I used to like protein smoothies and spinach smoothies, but I've heard that it's better to eat those vegetables rather than drink them. What is what is occurring there? Yeah, a uh, good question. Um it it is better to eat them. I I would say if you're making a smoothie and you're you're leaving all of the the fiber and like the plant pulp in there, I think you're still eating like a whole fruit or a vegetable. Um, it's when we're juicing and we're, we're taking away all that roughage, um, you're kind of removing some of that network that nutrients like to be in. Um, in that case, I do recommend, you know, juice... Is, is fine. You're still going to get vitamins and minerals from that. Um, but I always recommend like one a day and then try to get the rest of your fruits and vegetables in whole form. So I'm, I'm a big fan of smoothies and blending, but as long as you're just keeping everything in there, um, you're still going to get all the fiber and, and the benefit of a whole fruit or vegetable. Thanks. Yeah. Do you recommend organic? They always talk about the dirty dozen. Good question. Um, you know, kind of my, my rule of thumb is any fruit or vegetable is a good fruit or vegetable. So um, they are doing some research on organic versus conventional. So I think we'll have some more information on that in the future. Um, but I think kind of the main concern is like pesticide residues and things like that. Organic foods, they still use pesticides. They just use different ones. So there's still going to be some residues there. Um, the big thing is, you know, washing your fruits and vegetables and, and being food safe that way. Um, and that's going to help get, get that stuff off. Um, it's more beneficial to, to eat any fruit or vegetable than to not have any at all. So, yeah, good question. Any more questions online? Nope. Okay. okay. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. for your time in preparing this presentation for Primetime Alive today. I'll just remind everybody here that our next upcoming programs are, um, Vicki will be at, have a booth at the Senior Expo, uh, Wednesday, October 18th, 9 to 3 at the Gateway Hotel. Um, we also have our Clayton Farms tour coming up Thursday, October 26th at 1.30. I think space is limited, so if you do want to come to that program, be sure to get in touch with Vicki or sign up online soon. And then um, November 1st at 2 o'clock here in the auditorium, we have a program called Advanced Directives, Making Your Wishes Known. So we look forward to seeing you there, and thanks for coming today. Thank you. <laughs>